This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging and Center for Healthy Aging's monthly public lecture series. For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Danielle Glorioso, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Healthy Aging. At the Center and the Stein Institute, we're committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, training, and community outreach. Um, this lecture series is an example of the community outreach programs that we have, and I'm sure many of you are aware that we've been hosting these lecture series for over 30 years now. The idea really is to get exciting advances that are happening in the field of aging out to the community so that you know a little bit more about what we're learning here on campus. Um, like I mentioned, it's been held for free for over 30 years now through the generosity of donors. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce that tonight's lecture series is sponsored by the local company Great Call. They've been so generous in sponsoring our work and collaborating with us at the Center for Healthy Aging, and it's become a wonderful partnership and part of the reason why we can provide this great uh, lecture tonight to you at no charge. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Great Call, they are the leading provider of easy-to-use technology for active aging. They have a number of technology products like Great Call Splash, Jitterbug, Jitterbug Touch, um, some really neat products. Uh, and you can learn more about them on our website, which is aging.ucsd.edu. Um, our talk tonight is a good friend and colleague, Dr. Brent Mossbach. Dr. Mossbach is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at UC San Diego. He's received a number of research grants from the National Institute on Health focusing on stress, coping, and resilience in uh, caregivers and dementia. Uh, his most recent grants have been randomized clinical trials examining treatment efficacy for reducing distress and enhancing physical well-being in dementia caregivers. His presentation tonight will describe some of his findings from the Alzheimer Caregiver Program here at UC San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brent Mossbach. Thank you, everyone, and thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate your attendance here. Thank you to Great Call for sponsoring this lecture series. Um, I'm hoping that you can walk away from this lecture with a little bit of information about caregiving and stress and its impact on emotional and physical well-being, but also to have some ideas, some takeaways about what uh, you can do if you're a caregiver or kinds of tips you can give to caregivers that might be helpful to them to reduce the stress and reduce the burnout that might accompany their role as caregivers. Although I'm the one here tonight doing this lecture, it's not just me who's doing this research, and I want to acknowledge all the other people who are part of the UC San Diego Alzheimer's Caregiver Project, both the current team and, on, and members of prior uh, iterations of this project. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this by other professors and, and research staff, and these are some of the names. I'm sure that I've missed a few, but these are just some of the names of the people who've been involved in the research and the findings that you'll be hearing about tonight. So the outline of my presentation, and I, just, I also want to emphasize that uh, the focus of this presentation, although we've used the term generally about caregiver, there are all types of caregivers, caregivers of people with all kinds of disabilities or illnesses, and, and the focus of the research that we've been doing here at UC San Diego has been on Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers. So the takeaway that you'll receive tonight is, the, is about what can be done to fight caregiver burnout as it applies to dementia caregivers. 
But as far as the presentation goes, I'm gonna provide a, a brief overview of the kinds of people or who the people are who are providing care to individuals with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. I'm gonna be describing the psychological and emotional consequences that accompany providing care. And then I'm gonna move on and describe some of the physical consequences of caregiving, but I'm also gonna have a subset of my presentation focusing on for whom and under what circumstances is caregiving related to some of these poor physical and emotional health outcomes. And then I'm gonna finish by describing what can be done to mitigate some of the emotional and physical consequences of caregiving. So the very first portion of my presentation will be an overview of caregiver characteristics. Who are the individuals who are providing care? I think it's important to start with why is it important to study caregiving? And what you see here on this slide is that in 2010, just recently, there were approximately 4.7 million individuals who had Alzheimer's disease in this country. And we are now entering the baby boom generation. This is an aging country, as as many societies in this world, we are an aging, uh, we are an aging country. And as individuals reach the 65 and above age groups, you can see that in the next four decades, we are gonna see a tremendous rise in the number of individuals who have Alzheimer's disease. So it's gonna move from nearly 5 million to nearly 14 million individuals. And when you have more and more individuals with Alzheimer's disease, precluding the fact if we do not find a cure or some way of preventing the cognitive declines that accompany Alzheimer's disease, then there's going to be more and more individuals in the society who are gonna be providing direct care for those individuals who develop Alzheimer's disease. So that's just a, as a description of the importance of why we're looking at what we're looking at. But here's some caregiver characteristics that we have found here, and the, the data that you're gonna be seeing here comes from our project here at UC San Diego, and also from a national project that, in, a, that was in, conducted in six cities across the United States. And when you look at the data, the vast majority of individuals who are providing care for someone with Alzheimer's or other form of dementia are females. 80% of individuals are females. Uh, you look on this slide and you can see that the majority of individuals are either a spouse, that's 48%, or a child of the individual who has Alzheimer's or dementia. The remaining 10% are essentially nieces, nephews, uh, brothers, sisters, family members typically, um, but not a spouse or a child. The vast majority of individuals reside in the 40 to 60 age bracket, although if you look at the 60 and above age brackets, you get more than 50% of individuals, approximately 55% of individuals are caregivers are um, 60 years of age or older. And the number of hours that these individuals report that they provide direct care to their loved one who has Alzheimer's uh, ranges uh, a, a large number of individuals, 30%, almost one third of individuals who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's or other form of dementia are providing nine or more hours of care in a given day. So it, for a lot of these individuals, it has become a full-time job. So now let's focus a little bit about on the psychological and emotional consequences that accompany becoming a caregiver. What you see here are a number of um, questions that we ask individuals about how burdened they are, or how much stress they experience as a function of being a caregiver. And the focus here that we're really looking at is the length of the bar here. So you can see that when we ask people, how much do you feel that caring for, for your loved one has negatively affected your relationship with other individuals, family members, friends, and those kinds of things. 30%, approximately 30% of individuals will endorse that, say that at least somewhat, frequently or always, um, has affected my relationship. 30% of individuals will say that that has happened. More than 30% will say they've lost control of their life. More than 50% will say that they've been stressed trying to meet their responsibilities at work or with, or with family and those kinds of things. Nearly 60% of individuals will say they do not have enough time for themselves or that their social life has suffered as a function of being a caregiver. This slide is going to be discussing the hopelessness and helplessness that sometimes accompanies being a caregiver. And what you can see, we have, we, and here at UC San Diego, we have focused on not just caregivers, but we wanna make comparisons between caregivers and individuals who are of similar age, are married, but the person they're married to does not have a disability or a health condition of any kind. So we consider it a standard sort of normal marriage. What you see here is that when we ask individuals, do you feel that you have little control over the things that happen to you? 10% of the married 
individuals, non-caregivers, will say that that's the case for them. 40% of the caregivers will endorse that statement, at least somewhat. When you move up the list here, you can, say there's, you can see that in this one here, there's no way to solve some of the problems that I have. 20% of the non-caregivers will endorse that somewhat, at least somewhat, and 62% of the caregiver sample will say that that's true of them, at least somewhat. So what kind of depressive symptoms? These are, this is a description of the kinds of depressive symptoms that caregivers will endorse. <clears throat> Again, you can see more than 40% of caregivers will say that they, in a given, in the past two weeks, they've at least somewhat said, felt that they could not get going. They couldn't get the energy to get out and do the things that they need to do. When you move up this list, again, more than 40%, I couldn't shake the blues. I had trouble concentrating, more than 50%. Again, more than 50% of individuals, everything that they did was an effort for them. Felt depressed and sad, nearly 60% of caregivers will say that that's at least somewhat true for them. So these are the most common depressive symptoms that caregivers will report to us. So let's take a look at rates of clinically significant symptoms of depression. On this slide, I want to make a comparison. I want to show you how caregivers compare to the US population of individuals aged 65 years or older. So I'm going to start with the individuals. This is within the last two weeks. It's a point prevalence kind of issue. We're going to find out that 14.6% of the US population aged 65 years or older have endorsed at least clinically significant symptoms of depression. When you look at white, black, and Hispanic caregivers, you can see the rates of clinically significant depressions in those groups. And when you look at caregivers overall, 41% clinically significant symptoms of depression. Uh, that is almost three times the rate of those individuals who are in similar age demographic as the, as the their caregivers. So those are just uh, a pretty good, I think people can walk away with a pretty good idea that this is an incredibly stressful, it causes a lot of stress and distress for individuals. But let's focus now on what does this emotional and psychological distress do to individuals physically? So in 1999, there was a seminal study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Richard Schultz from the University of Pittsburgh. He was looking at mortality rates in caregivers versus non-caregivers over a four-year study period. And what he found was that if you were married, but your spouse was not disabled, 9.4% of individuals within that subgroup ended up dying in the four-year study period. Then he had two other subgroups of caregivers. He asked the caregiver, are you a caregiver? And are you experiencing strain? And he categorized those individuals into low levels of emotional strain and high levels of emotional strain. Among those individuals who were caregivers with low emotional strain, 13.8% of that subpopulation ended up dying in the four-year period. Among the caregivers with high strain, 17.3% ended up dying in that period. When you compare the caregivers with low strain to those who were married but the spouse was not disabled, there was a 46.8% increased risk for mortality, although that difference was not significant, statistically or scientifically, mathematically different. When you compare these groups, an 84% increased risk for mortality, which was uh, statistically significant. So the takeaway from this slide that the investigators reported was, it's not all caregivers who are at risk for mortality or a significant risk for mortality. It's those caregivers who are experiencing the highest levels of strain. So let's focus then, why is it then? What is it about caregiving? What's going on internally, physiologically, that might explain why caregivers are more likely to experience mortality. Here in our research lab at UC San Diego, we've been focusing on caregiving and its risk for cardiovascular diseases. So there was a study that was conducted by Vitaliano in 2002, where they followed 58 caregivers and 68 non-caregivers for a 30-month study period. They monitored those individuals' ICD-9 chart diagnosis for various heart diseases. And here are the list of heart disease diagnoses that we're interested in looking at. And what they found that was by 30 months, 14 of the 58 caregivers, 24%, had one of those diagnoses. Seven out of 68 of the non-caregivers, 10%, experienced and uh, actually developed a heart disease diagnosis. So the relative risk of caregivers was 2.34, which indicates that there was 134% increased risk for heart disease diagnosis over that 30-month period. 
I should note that the majority of the heart disease cases that occurred in the caregivers were male. So now let's focus a little bit on female caregivers, which as I described in a previous slide, are the majority of caregivers. So Lee in 2003 published a study in which they studied registered nurses from 11 United US states. All of these individuals were female. And here's the breakdown of, of the subgroups of individuals. 20, almost 26,000 of these nurses were not providing direct care for someone with any kind of disability or dementia. The remaining are broken down here, as you can see. And they followed these individuals for four years and monitored heart disease as per review of medical records as per the previous study. And they were looking at two essential outcomes, non-fatal myocardial infarction or a fatal coronary heart disease. What they found, the essential findings of their study, was that there were no differences when you just look at caregivers and non-caregivers. If you compare just anyone who's a caregiver to anyone who's not a caregiver, you do not get significant differences in those particular forms of heart disease. However, it did matter how much care these individuals were providing, how much strain and how much expectation was being, or uh, stress was being placed on them as part of their care, caregiving. So women who provided less than eight hours or eight or fewer hours of care per day were at an 11% increased risk for developing one of those heart conditions. That was not significant. It was the women who were providing nine or more hours, as I pr pr demonstrated in my previous slide, was about 30% of caregivers. They were at an 82% increased risk for developing one of those conditions. So again, it's the men who are developing heart disease, but also the women who are the most strained and most stressed with the amount of work that they're providing and care that they're providing. So then there was a, I was fortunate enough to be a part of this National Resources for Enhancing Alzheimer's Caregiver Health Study when I was training to be um, uh, um, getting my PhD. And we had access to a number of um, caregivers in those six cities across the United States. There were more than 800 caregivers from six US cities. We followed them over an 18 month period and we were interested in knowing if they ever developed a new diagnosis of any of these particular health conditions. And our primary interest in this study was to try and understand if clinically significant symptoms of depression, as I alluded to in my prior slide, are quite high in caregivers, were associated with one of these diagnoses, new, new diagnoses of, of those cardiovascular diseases over that 18 month period. So what we found in our study was that over that 18 month period, 34 out of 508 caregivers that did not have significant symptoms of depression ended up developing one of those forms of cardiovascular disease, 6.7%. Nearly twice as many of the caregivers with significant symptoms of depression developed cardiovascular diseases, 12.6%. So again, the relative risk is 1.88 or 88% 80 increased risk for cardiovascular diseases among the more depressed caregivers. Now, in this particular slide, we did a survival analysis. What you see along this y-axis here are everyone starts off without any of those cardiovascular diseases. As individuals develop a cardiovascular diagnosis, these lines drop and we eventually get down to a point where somewhere between 85 and 90 percent remain cardiovascular diagnosis free. What you see here is that this green line represents the cases the caregivers who were more depressed and their accumulation of cardiovascular diseases. What we're looking at, are these lines different across time? Any given point in time, if you, if you measure uh, differences in cardiovascular diagnosis at this time or this time or any of these times, what's the relative risk um, or the relative risk for developing cardiovascular disease? In this case, it's 1.67, which indicates there was a 67, if you, at any given point in time, caregivers who were more depressed or had clinically significant symptoms of depression were at risk for developing a cardiovascular disease diagnosis. It's also noteworthy from this study that for every year, if, if a person had been providing care for five years when they entered this study, and another person had been providing care for 10 years as they entered the study, for every year that they had been providing care prior to their enrollment, the risk for developing a cardiovascular diagnosis went up by 4%. So this is again sort of a wear and tear kind of thing. As caregivers continuously and repeatedly over years develop or experience these chronic stresses that are associated with being a caregiver, their risk for developing a cardiovascular diagnosis is, is rising. I should also note that um, these analyses controlled for or already partialed out the effects of many um, common risks 
for cardiovascular diseases. Older people tend to have higher risk for developing a cardiovascular disease, so we, we took that effect out prior to looking at the effect of depression. Health, smoker versus non-smoker, and those kinds of things as well. So we've talked about caregivers being at increased risk for mortality. We've talked about caregivers being at increased risk for developing cardiovascular diseases. Let's kind of focus a little bit on why is it then that caregivers have an increased risk for developing these cardiovascular diseases. So this is our conceptual model that we've been using here at UC San Diego. Um, it was developed by Dr. Igor Grant, who's been sort of the seminal person of our project. And the essential idea here is that as people experience chronic stress and negative moods and their sleep suffers, they end up having physiologic changes. There are blood coagulation markers that rise, inflammation markers rise, they experience sympathoadrenal medullary arousal, and then their blood pressure tends to rise. As these physiologic changes occur, those can cause changes or risk for vascular pathology, which I'm only going to focus on briefly tonight, but I'll give some description of what we do in our project. So as far as our first um, section of this portion of, this, of the presentation, I want to talk about how stress and caregiving alters blood coagulation markers. So the blood, one of the blood coagulation markers that's really of importance to us in our research study is called D-dimer. And I'm going to give a brief overview um, of what D-dimer is here. As the body experiences stress or injury, it releases a host of clotting uh, molecules and the body's clotting system is activated. And when the clotting system is activated, the body produces thrombin, uh, which contributes to the formation of fibrin, and fibrin molecules essentially link together like a net and uh, pull protein strands in and that form the basis of a blood clot. But another function of fibrin is that it activates the clot dissolving system. And I put that in quotes because that's just a good general description of what it does. And ultimately what the body's uh, clot dissolving system does is it begins to dissolve the clot and it produces these fragments. It sort of, I guess you could say, chips away at the net or the, or the clot. And these fragments kind of come across and enter the bloodstream and those are D-dimers. So if you have elevated D-dimer levels in your system, it could mean that the body's clot formation and dissolving systems have been activated. So are D-dimer levels actually an indication of risk for some form of risk for uh, cardiovascular uh, problems? So here I'm going to show you a slide about D-dimer and your risk for future venous thrombosis. And what we have down here are five numbers. Each number represents a 20th percentile. Individuals who are in the number one here represent those individuals who have the lowest 20% levels of D-dimer in their bloodstream. Individuals who are in the five level are in the highest 20% of individuals who have D-dimer of, of levels in their system. So of course, uh, we're making comparisons to those individuals with the lowest levels of D-dimer in their system. And as we see individuals having higher and higher levels of D-dimer, their risk for a future venous thrombosis increases such that if you're in the highest 20th percentile, your risk rises to being fourfold that of the individuals who are in the lowest 20th percentile. So yes, uh, high D-dimer levels can be dangerous um, for a person's health. So let's take a look at comparison, comparisons of D-dimer levels in caregivers versus non-caregivers. When you look at the non-caregivers, individuals who are married and their married partner does not have an illness or dementia of any kind, D-dimer levels are somewhere in the four to 500 uh, nanograms per milliliter range. In comparison, caregivers are over nearly, or it looks like it's over 700. And, these, and, these, and therefore, the caregivers here, you can see, are, have significantly higher levels of D-dimers compared to the non-caregivers. This is just a snapshot at one point in time of where caregivers are. What about over time as they age? On this slide, I'm going to show you the, the relationship between advancing age and D-dimer levels among non-caregivers and caregivers. As with many biological markers, D-dimer naturally rises as individuals get older. And this, we think, represents a nice depiction of how a normal, sort of normal aging process. This is just how non-caregivers represent sort of the normal aging process. But how about caregivers? It's an advanced, accelerated, we, I kind of look at this as sort of accelerated biological aging. 
you see an accelerated, accelerated rate of D-dimer levels in the system as individuals get older among caregivers. So let's now uh, go back to our conceptual model. And I'm going to now talk a little bit about how the stress and distress of caregiving impacts inflammation markers. And the focus of the inflammation marker I'm going to be talking about is interleukin-6. It's called a short for, the short term for it is IL-6. It's an inflammatory molecule. It's tailored to function as an SOS signal during the stress response. Um, its presence represents a coordinated response of the body to some form of aggression. Um, so if an individual experiences an injury or some form of infection, uh, or if they experience acute psychological distress, as you might expect in the caregiving role, um, the body uh, has the response of promptly uh, in, in, in releasing massive um, levels of IL-6 by white blood cells. So IL-6 helps initiate the activation of T cells and the formation of blood and blood cells, and it also stimulates antibody production. So, um, however, if you have high, if individual has high concentrations of IL-6 in their system, it's indicating that there's ongoing inflammation in the body, which has been found to predict cardiovascular diseases and events. And if we were to summarize the role of IL-6 in simple terms, we would say that the short-term presence of IL-6 may be helpful because it's representing the body's response to aggressors. But long-term presence of IL-6 is harmful to the cardiovascular system. Well, how harmful is the presence of IL-6? Well, that's the focus of this slide, whereas again, we have the quintiles at the bottom. Those individuals who have the lowest 20% 20, 20 levels of IL-6 in their system are the reference group. We're comparing all other groups to these individuals. As we see IL-6 rise, we see the risk for development of coronary heart disease rise, such that when you're in the highest 20th percentile, your risk for coronary heart disease is more than twice that of those individuals who are in the lowest, lowest 20th percentile. Again, that is the risk associated with IL-6. Now let's take a look at IL-6 levels in caregivers as we found in our research program here at UC San Diego. This is the IL-6 levels for non-caregivers. Here we have the levels for caregivers. There is a significant difference between these groups. And again, this is just a snapshot. This is just going out, collecting blood samples, having them assayed for IL-6 at any given point in time. Let's take a look at IL-6 levels across time or across age groups of caregivers versus non-caregivers. I will note that this, with this uh, slide is uh, a summary of findings from Janice Kikolt Glazer at Ohio State. Um, what we see here is, again, what we would consider normal aging. Non-caregivers uh, rise over time in IL-6 levels. Here we have IL-6 levels over time for the caregiving sample. So again, accelerated biological aging as per inflammation markers. Let's move then to the effect of stress and distress on a concept that we're going to talk about called flow mediated dilation. It's an indicator of vascular pathology. So again, just a summary of what the endothelium does. The endothelium is a thin lining covering the internal surface of blood vessels. What its role, one of its roles is to sense changes in hemodynamic forces or blood flow. When it detects these hemodynamic changes, it responds by releasing vasoactive substances. One of those substances is nitrous oxide, which is designed to help arteries dilate. Um, the uh, role of the endothelium uh, in uh, cardiovascular diseases, it's, it's actually uh, implicated in the pathogenesis and clinical course of all known cardiovascular diseases, and it's been associated with future risk of adverse cardiovascular events. So I'm going to show you an image, this is from our research study, where we're going out and we're testing caregivers' endothelial functioning in their homes. And what we have here, hopefully it's, it's, um, it's, people can see this okay. What we have here is we place a blood pressure cuff on the individual's forearm. Here we have an ultrasound wand that's taking an image of the brachial artery, and we're collecting images on this ultrasound machine. What we do is we inflate that blood pressure cuff and we let it stay inflated for five minutes, which serves the function of preventing blood flow to the forearm. And after, after the um, blood flow has been prevented for that five minute period, we release the blood pressure cuff and blood rushes down the arm, causing shear stress on the artery, stimulating the endothelium to release nitrous oxide. What we did be prior to this test is we had the image of their baseline arterial diameter, natural in a resting state, 
And then what we do is we continue to take images of the artery as it dilates after the blood pressure cuff has been released. And what we're looking for is the total amount of dilation that has occurred as a function of this test. Greater dilation indicates healthier arterial functioning or endothelial functioning. Lower dilation indicates there may be something going on that's problematic. So here's an image that describes how the test works. At baseline, we have their, their baseline resting diameter. And then over time, at 15 seconds, we collect an image of the artery and measure how much over their baseline level it has increased in dilation. So here, approximately 3% increased dilation of the artery. We continue to follow the, the artery over time, such that within one to three minutes, the, the artery should have maxed out in terms of its dilation. In this case, the artery has dilated um, about 15%, and then the artery will eventually return to baseline levels. So in this, this is a slide that was uh, collected of a research study published in Circulation in 2000. It uh, describes the, re the relationship between this particular test, flow-mediated dilation or flow-dependent dilation, and risk for cardiovascular events. I'm going to focus on this because these individuals focused on a number of different uh, tests. And what we have here is total dilation. I don't have the axes listed here, but you can kind of get the idea from the slide. This is the amount of dilation that was occurring during this test for individuals who went on and did not develop any kind of cardiovascular event. This is the amount of dilation that was occurring in individuals who went on to develop some kind of cardiovascular event. It is very clear that those individuals who did not develop an event had greater or better arterial dilation as a function of this test than those who ended up having a cardiovascular event. So let's look at caregivers then. How does endothelial function or dysfunction, I should say, uh, 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 vary as a function of being a caregiver. What we have here is, on the x-axis here, we have the total number of years the individual had been providing care prior to entry into our research study here at UC. Here we have total dilation over their baseline arterial di uh, diameter. What you see then is that the caregivers who had been providing care for the longest time had the lowest levels of dilation. And this correlation was actually quite strong, such that, again, this gets back to the issue of the longer you've been providing care, the more chronic stress you've experienced in your, in your role as a caregiver could have some implications for arterial function or endothelial function. So we've talked a little bit about endothelial function. We've talked a little bit about inflammation. We've talked a little bit about uh, coagulation. But is this really the case for all caregivers? Or are there a certain subset of caregivers who are at most risk? So let's talk about the, go back to the issue of interleukin-6 or IL-6. One of the interests that I have, and I should mention my training is in clinical psychology, and I'm very interested in knowing how well people cope with their caregiving role. So we ask people a series of questions about how confident they are in their ability to initiate and develop action plans in their most stressful situations. How confident are you that you can, that you can uh, figure out a solution to your most difficult problems? That's just an example of the kind of question we ask. So we ask people, and we categorize them into in those who had low confidence versus those who had high confidence. So what you see here is the relationship between stress levels. As people experience more and more stress, how are their IL-6 levels accompanying their increased levels of stress? In individuals with low confidence, as they experience more stress, as is expected, IL-6 levels go up. How, though, do IL-6 levels change as a function of having high confidence? It looks like it's going down, but the essential takeaway you should get from this is that it remains pretty stable. You can experience more and more stress, and your IL-6 levels do not rise if you're more confident that you can initiate an action plan and find solutions to your most difficult caregiving problems. So this is an idea, this kind of raises the issue of resilience. How can we then, so the, so the take home from this is, is there some strategy we can use to help caregivers develop the skills that they would need to resolve some of their most difficult and challenging caregiving problems? So now let's talk a little bit about uh, activation and how people feel emotionally. So I'm going to provide some, just some case presentation. These are case presentations of participants who were enrolled in our project in the last iteration, which was from 2007 to 2012. So we actually asked individuals, we know that it's, we, we kind of acknowledge that caregiving is stressful. 
But what are you actually doing in your free time? Are you actually engaging in events and activities that are rewarding for you, enjoyable for you, pleasant, and those kinds of things? And we were wondering if, as people did more and more of these activities, did they experience more and more positive moods? So we followed indiv individuals for five years, and I'm just going to show you how three of these, or two or three of these individuals, how these concepts of engaging in pleasant and enjoyable activities relates to their mood. So as they, uh, continue, as they do more and more pleasant events, their positive moods rise. As they discontinue or do fewer of these events, their moods go down. And you can see over time these are quite well related to each other. And this is uh, endorsement of a, uh, of a behavioral theory of depression and, uh, that I sub sort of subscribe to, I guess you could say. Here's a second participant. What's the relationship between their engagement in pleasant events and their positive moods? Again, as they do more, their positive moods rise and they feel better and more uh, happy, I guess you could say, or energized. And as they could discontinue doing some of these activities, their mood dips. So we also were interested, is engagement in these kinds of pleasurable and enjoyable activities related to vascular function, endothelial function? So again, we have th I have three slides I'm going to show you of the relationship between three participants in our study. What you see is, as the individual is engaged in taking care of themselves and doing more things for themselves, their arteries are dilating at higher rates. But as they discontinue these things, the artery goes back down. I'm just going to go through these. You can just see that same pattern occurring for these three individuals. So this person was four years, and I think that this is a sort of an indication of what we were interested in. It sort of set the tone for us. Um, what are we going to do then to help caregivers? Well, this could be one of those things that could not only improve their emotional well-being, but may have some implications for cardiovascular well-being. So that's the focus of the next section of my presentation. I'm going to describe what can be done to mitigate some of these emotional and physical consequences of caregiving. So, is it possible that if we help caregivers treat their depressive symptoms, clinically significant depressive symptoms, we may be helping reduce their cardiovascular disease risk? That's the speculation that we have. And we conducted a small uh, pilot clinical trial, uh, and we were interested in determining if this brief evidence-based caregiver intervention was more effective than a time equivalent support and education intervention for reducing depressive symptoms in caregivers. We were also interested in determining if our caregiver intervention could successfully modify interleukin-6 relative to a support and information condition. And really what we were interested in was we were aware that this does not answer the question definitively, but it was really a proof of concept. If we can demonstrate that our intervention has some impact on one of these cardiovascular disease risk biomarkers, maybe we can then conduct a larger study where we can expand our emphasis from IL-6 to other biomarkers of cardiovascular disease risk. Proof of concept. So what we did was we enrolled 100 caregivers. All of them were family members of someone who had dementia. All of them were at least 55 years of age and they were living in the same home taking care of the individual with dementia. We conducted a pre-treatment and post-treatment assessment, both biological and um, emotional and psychological. And we were really interested in determining what percent of, the, of individuals in each of these treatment conditions had their depressive symptoms cut in half or, and or their interleukin-6 levels reduced by half. So this is the emphasis of the two conditions, both the Behavioral activation and education and support condition were six sessions. Both of this, each of the sessions meeting with a therapist lasted about one hour. And all of the therapy sessions occurred in the caregivers' homes. This is just an acknowledgement that not all caregivers can leave their loved ones or find care for their loved ones that go off and visit with us at UC. So we went out to their homes and met with them in their homes and provided the therapeutic intervention. The emphasis, however, of these two interventions differed. In the behavioral activation treatment, the emphasis was on uh, acknowledging that often in the caregiving role, the stresses are beyond their control, but what you do with yourself and your own personal behaviors is still within your control, and you can make choices. You can make different choices about what you do. We all acknowledge that distress is a function of reduced exposure to these pleasant situations or pleasant activities, as I alluded to in prior slides. 
And what we do is we help the caregivers to systematically increase their exposure to positive events and reduce avoidant behaviors. Examples of be avoidant behaviors would be things like, I don't think it'll be any fun, so I don't really want to go. I'm going to avoid going out. Or I think my, if I bring my husband or my, my wife with me, she might act up, so I'm going to try not to do that. So I'm going to stay home and, and not be embarrassed when I'm out. So that's sort of an avoidant behavior. In this condition, we were um, focusing on the idea that stresses could be effectively managed. And so what we would do is we would teach them problem-solving skills to manage some of their most difficult stresses. A second and probably key emphasis of this was that we were there to provide emotional support for these individuals. And we gave them uh, educational materials and basic psychoeducation on how to communicate with their care receivers, how to manage their, their own personal emotions, so some cognitive-based therapy techniques, and also how to plan for the future. So if they were interested in looking at nursing home placement or were interested in estate planning and those kinds of things, we would provide them with referrals of agencies in the community who could give them support and information in that area, in those areas. So uh, briefly, what we're looking at here is um, what percentage of individuals in each of these conditions demonstrated a 10% or 20 or 30 or what this level of uh, reduction in their depressive symptoms from pre to post treatment. What you can see is that uh, over 50% and over 60% in the, in the behavioral activation condition showed at least a 10% reduction in their depressive symptoms from pre to post treatment. So as we move along though, we get to those individuals who demonstrated at least a 30% reduction in their depressive symptoms. 25% of the individuals in the support and education condition had a 30% reduction in their depressive symptoms. Again, over 50% of individuals in the behavioral activation showed a 50% reduction in their depressive symptoms. When we move along to 40 and 50%, what you see here is that uh, more than a third of the caregivers in the behavioral activation condition, which was again engaging in rewarding and pleasurable activities, showed a 50% reduction in depressive symptoms, whereas only 14% of people in the support and education condition showed those levels. I will say that um, uh, uh, when we looked at what was the amount of change over time, we used a brief version of, the, of, a, of a depression scale called the Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale. Um, we saw that the average score at baseline was approximately 12 to 15 the average change representing 50% change was between eight and nine points on this scale. So pretty significant um, reduction in depressive symptoms. So let's take a look at response in terms of IL-6. Again, we have what percentage of individuals showed a 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50% reduction in their IL-6 levels by condition. I'm just gonna go through these one quickly. 8% of individuals in the support and education condition showed a 50% reduction in IL-6 and more than one in four caregivers in the behavioral activation condition showed a reduction in their IL-6 of 50%. So what, what's the kind of take home from this clinical trial? Providing caregivers with a systematic means of raising their engagement in pleasurable activities in our clinical uh, proof of concept study uh, was associated with significant, clinically significant reductions in depressive symptoms. It was also associated with clinically significant reductions in interleukin-6 which is again a marker of inflammation and a cardiovascular disease risk marker. We also demonstrated that significant reductions in depression in IL-6, well actually we know that clinically significant reductions in those factors are theoretically linked to cardiovascular disease as I've kind of talked about in my prior slides. And so what we believe is that behavioral activation therapy not only improves overall quality of life but it may produce some benefit to reducing long-term risk for developing cardiovascular disease diagnoses. Well, we should put some caveats on this. It's just a small trial. We only used one biomarker, interleukin-6, found a result there. Uh, there are many, many biomarkers of cardiovascular disease risk. So what we need to do is we need to get more work to determine whether other biomarkers of cardiovascular disease risk also change as a function of therapeutic interventions. And so what we're doing now is we just got funded from the NIH to conduct a larger scale study looking at two these same treatment conditions for reducing a number of cardiovascular disease risk markers of coagulation. So again, we, we're looking at D-dimer, which was a focus of this presentation. Can we make any change in D-dimer levels as a function of caregiver interventions. Can we make changes to other markers of inflammation besides interleukin-6, such as C-reactive protein, which is a 
later stage marker of cardiovascular disease risk, and sort of an end stage, uh, closer uh, downstream marker. And then we're looking at vascular pathology, one of which is going to be flow-mediated dilation. And we're going to look to see if these interventions have any impact over a two-year study period on these biomarkers of cardiovascular disease risk. So I want to thank you again all for attending. That's the end of the presentation. And uh, I just put this up here just in case any individuals here had an interest in asking questions of us, finding out more information. Um, you can write down the number and we'd be happy to answer questions and talk with you on the phone. But uh, for now, I can answer questions. And uh, thank you again very much. Absolutely, yeah. So the question is, what's the, if, what are the sort of technical differences between dementia and Alzheimer's? Dementia is a broad umbrella term that describes individuals who have memory and cognitive loss, uh, brain degenerative cognitive loss. So it's just a general term that describes individuals experiencing symptoms and cognitive difficulties, most typically memory loss. That can include things like Parkinson's, Lewy bodies, and the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So the, so the dementia is just a broad umbrella term, and each disease would be a specific form of, and one of them is Alzheimer's. So the majority of people that we see in our studies have Alzheimer's, thus we refer to ourselves as the Alzheimer's caregiver study, but we do have individuals with other forms of dementia that um, can cause distress for individuals too. So hopefully that answers the question, yeah. Yeah, okay, so behavioral activation. What is behavioral activation? So there's a theory of depression. It's been around for, since the 70s. It's considered a behavioral theory. And it essentially says that as individuals experience stresses in their lives, chronic stresses like we talked about tonight, often one of the things that goes is they reallocate their resources and energy towards the stresses. And what seems to go often is things that they can do for themselves that are pleasurable, rewarding, that provide them with some joy and satisfaction with their lives. And when that goes, there's greater risk for depression. This theory has been tested in a number of populations. We've demonstrated it in, car in, in caregivers, but it's also been shown in cancer patients. It's been shown in cancer caregivers and different populations that are undergoing stresses. So the basic theory is that as you find yourself in situations that are not rewarding and positively reinforcing for you, you're at risk and you develop more and more depressive symptoms. Behavioral activation is a theoretical approach, uh, uh, an evidence-based therapy that essentially says, let's systematically figure out how we can re-engage you in positive behaviors that will be rewarding for you and satisfying for you. So you, you essentially work with these individuals to sort of schedule them into their daily lives, identify what those might be, because it's very specific to each in individual. Many of the people in this room may have dramatically different interests than I do, but it would be focusing on, for me, sort of the things that would be enjoyable for me and rewarding for me. And as they sort of do more and more of these things, the depressive symptoms tend to go down and, and they feel better emotionally and psychologically. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, that's just a, yep. Well, what we do, part of the program, would be that we work with individuals to simply identify the kinds of things that are of interest to them. And then we do this sort of activity hierarchy where we say, when you think of the maybe 10 to 15 things that are of most interest and that would be most rewarding and pleasurable for you, let's rank them. The, the thing that you think you can do despite caregiving like maybe go for a walk around the block, or listen to your favorite music, or do something like that that might bring you some level of satisfaction, let's rate that a one. And as you kind of move down this hierarchy, you might get to things like, oh, I want to go on a vacation, but that's really hard. There's just no way I can do that. So that's really difficult. And then what we do is we say, let's start with those things that you feel you can do right now. So I guess the, base, the case example that I can provide, because I've been out there with the caregivers, is that one person said, I, there's nothing I can do. I can't think of anything that I can do. And I said, oh, please. You know, I was almost sort of begging and saying, could you please go and, and identify something? And she said, well, uh, I, have this, um, I have these old videotapes of our family that have been stored away in this cabinet. And I've really wanted to pull them out and watch them. 
because um, it's us when we were younger and our children were young and we just really had a lot of joy when, at that point. And so I said, she said, I really have wanted to pull those out and, and, and watch those videos. And I said, oh, please, that would be a fantastic, pleasant event that you could try. And so she, she did. I, I came back the next week. She had scheduled it in. She said she was going to do it. And I came back. And I was, a little, I was a little hesitant. I thought maybe she would say she didn't do it. But she said, oh, yeah, I pulled those out. And I watched them. And I said, so how did it go for you? And she said, oh, it was fantastic. I loved it. I, I had so much. I just, it was so wonderful to watch those tapes. And you know, my husband came in and he said, well, who are those people? And, and I didn't care. I didn't care what he said. I was focused on this and I had a lot of joy watching these things. And she was one of our biggest success cases. So she went from, I don't know if I can work with this person because she's not going to want to do it. But then she became one of our most um, persons that had the most benefit. She almost went to zero on our depression scale. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, maybe there's something that you and your husband can do together that you're still there with him or her, if it's, if it's the wife, and you don't feel guilty for taking time off. But we also try to appeal to their desire to remain healthy themselves. And if they hear some of the information that I presented here tonight about the benefits of doing this and being willing and able to do things that are good for you, you have some benefit to you, which means that when you're feeling better, and you're doing better emotionally, potentially physically, you can be a better caregiver. And your husband will, or wife will, recognize that and see that. Um, the, the, the thing that I often know from my own personal life is, when you're having a bad day, anyone can relate to this, when you're having a bad day, and then you go home and someone in the family or a spouse or a child starts getting on your nerves, normally that wouldn't bother you, but stop it, I've had a bad day, you know, and it becomes, you just become on edge. Littler things that, you, that jab you tend to bother you more. And so if we can get you to a point where maybe those little things don't bother you as much and you can put up with them a little bit better, then they might recognize, oh yeah, I can see that, I can see that. Yeah. Hopefully that rings true for some people, so. I think that, so we have, there have been many trials, so the question is, there is a support an information condition, and then there's a behavioral activation condition, and there are differences. But what would you get if you combined information from, from both of those into a single sort of intervention? I, uh, there have been, I, I didn't put a slide up on this, but there have been what were called meta-analyses, which are studies of all the studies that are out there. And what they do is they looked at any sort of intervention study for caregivers, and they found that there have been, since the, since the late 80s, over 80 clinical trials for caregivers. So we have a pretty good sense of what works and what doesn't work. And one form of intervention that seems to work for depressive symptoms, now we're the only group that I know of who's ever looked at the physical outcomes, but for depressive symptoms and stress and burnout and those kinds of things, one form of intervention is called multi-component. So multi-component interventions have many of the elements that you see here tonight. They have information, they have support, they have behavioral, act behavioral activation. The issue that I would say that is most concerned to me about having the multi-component is if you spend, in our case, six sessions on behavioral activation and you can get a pretty good result from that, which is a very simple, I mean, I think anyone in this room would agree, this is a pretty simple intervention. Um, and you do a, a multi-component intervention where you only get maybe one or two sessions that focus on behavioral activation and the rest of the stuff is also one or two sessions. Is that enough to give you enough information about what to do? I don't know, but they seem to work reasonably well, but a lot of times those multi-component interventions are 10 and 12 sessions. And uh, I guess the way I feel about it is, and this is sort of my own personal bias, it's possible you could get a bigger, bigger effect out of uh, longer and more um, all-encompassing interventions but I take a parsimonious approach and go with a briefer approach, which may end up giving you a little bit more bang for the buck in a sense, that's how I look at it. It's not just the caregiver who may experience some of the distress and physiologic changes, but it might also impact the person with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And as far as the biomarkers go, I don't have an answer to that. As far as the mood and emotional kinds of things, there have been some studies that have enrolled dyads, the partners together, and there's been some evidence that shows that as the caregiver goes, 
the person with dementia also goes, and they sort of feed off of each other in terms of the emotional. Um, you might see some behavioral disturbances more in the individuals who are being cared for by someone who's under a lot more distress. And that, of course, impacts the person in distress because they recognize these and are impacted by them more. And it's sort of like a cyclical thing. So yeah, there have been some studies that show uh, there is a relationship between the moods of these two, di the people, the, the dyads together go. So yep, well, the idea of the, uh, you talked a lot about the idea of the attitude of the caregiver. And how do you impact the attitude of the caregiver? And I, I will say this. The, um, uh, the emphasis of the behavioral activation is on the behaviors of the caregivers and that the change in behaviors and the rewarding and pleasant activities has an impact on people's depressive symptoms. And if you've ever, if anyone has ever seen someone who has truly sort of clinically significant symptoms of depression, you'll recognize that nothing works. This is, uh, everything is bad. Uh, I, I, they, they just have this negative outlook of themselves, perhaps. Maybe they have a negative outlook of the person they're caring for. They have a negative outlook on their future. It's just sort of, sort of some of the symptoms of depression just kind of in there. And, if, and so there's been some studies that have demonstrated that this particular form of therapy, while not truly working with these people on their attitude or what they're thinking, but really focusing on changing their moods through behavior, they've shown that as the mood starts becoming more and more restored, and that they feel more even keeled and essentially more positive, the cognitive elements of what's going on in caregiving become more positive. So um, I, re I can recall there was one study where they, they did a, a, a form of therapy called cognitive therapy. Uh, this was not with caregivers, but this was with people who were depressed. And what they found was that individuals who did cognitive therapy did have attitude change, and they did improve their moods. But they didn't improve any more than individuals who were focused in the behavioral side of things as well. Those individuals who were in the behavioral side, their moods improved. And as their moods improved, their thoughts became more and more positive. Their outlooks became more and more positive. Maybe they approached situations in life with a little more pep and a little more um, energy about it. So, but I do agree with you, and it's just as an endorsement of what you said about changing attitudes, the, the, the number one uh, form of therapy for caregivers that works for changing attitudes and for reducing depressive symptoms in particular is cognitive and behavior therapy, which does emphasize the person's attitude. It has had demonstrated as having the most positive effects. So. Thank you.